Entonces, eh, agradecemos la presencia de ustedes aquí al Auditorio del Instituto de Ciencias Naturales en una franja que es complementaria a la de los jueves de la biodiversidad, teniendo en cuenta que el profesor invitado Charles Griswold viaja mañana muy madrugado, tuvimos que hacerla hoy miércoles como invitado especial. El eh, profesor Griswold eh, trabaja en la Academia de California de Ciencias, la CAS, eh, aunque está recientemente jubilado. Eh, ha trabajado además en otros museos de Estados Unidos, como el Museo Americano de Nueva York, en el Smithsonian. Ha estado eh, en, en otras partes del mundo, como en Sudáfrica, Chile, Argentina, Brasil, y ahora eh, está compartiendo con nosotros esta finalización de su estadía y ha querido compartir con nosotros una conferencia acerca del papel de los museos de historia natural en lo que tiene que ver con sus aplicaciones para reconstrucción de historias y muchas otras aplicaciones que tienen que ver con la, nuestra sociedad. Entonces, eh, le agradezco la presencia del profesor Birbur y queda con ustedes. Thank you, Eduardo. Thank you all for coming this afternoon. I teach at the University of California, but I also work at a museum, the California Academy of Sciences. And what I want to do today is to talk about the special place that museums play in science, in the science of discovering life and in the science of communicating about life. I'll first give some history of my own museum, California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. I'll talk about how we collect data today and in the past. And I'll then talk some about how we share data. I'll give some examples of, uh, from my own research and from research by some of my colleagues Uh, concerning how these data help us to better understand the world, better communicate about the world, and better prepare to sustain the world. Finally, I will say something about how museums need to share information within and between countries, and I'll give examples about how this sharing of information and make us all much smarter and stronger in planning for a different future. So with that, um, may I have the next slide? Next. As I said, I work at a museum, the California Academy of Sciences. We have more than 20 million individual specimens. Insects on pens, fish in jars, uh, pots from archaeological sites, even entire whale skeletons. Of the specimens that we have at California Academy, um, nearly half a million are spiders. And it's spiders that I have spent my life studying. Next, please. I'd like to start with some history of the California Academy because it's one of the oldest natural history museums in the United States. It's in fact the first founded west of the Mississippi River. It was founded in 1853 during the so-called gold rush in California. The first president here is Andrew Randall. Uh, it was founded by a group of gentlemen who hoped to establish the civilization of the Enlightenment on the Pacific coast of North America. Next, please. Immediately, they began collecting and sharing specimens. These are historic specimens, large bees, from the collection of the California Academy of Sciences. It began as an institution for sharing stories, for sharing information, but soon became also an institution for conserving specimens and other data and for sharing these with the public. Next, please. Already in the year 1856, the museum had its own building. It was in the first congregational church in the city of San Francisco. And in this historic photograph from the 1850s, 
we can see some of the exhibits that were contained in the museum, including this uh, mammoth, an actual uh, skin of a, an extinct species of elephant that lived in the frozen parts of Europe and North America. Next, please. This is one of the first scientists to uh, volunteer at the Academy of Sciences. Hans Hermann Baer was from Europe, and he brought a European tradition of science with him. Here he is in his office at the old California Academy. He studied insects as well as other kinds of organisms. Next, please. Very early in the history of science in the Americas, the California Academy of Sciences became inclusive. Here are two women from the 19th century of California, and they are both scientists. Uh, Catherine Brandegee was a botanist, and Rosa Smith was an ichthyologist. She studied fish. And not only were they the first women scientists at the academy, they were the first scientists to be paid to do their research. So here in the 19th century, already the inclusiveness that lasts till today in San Francisco had begun over 150 years ago. Next, please. After two decades, the collections of the museum and the interest in science and natural history by the public had grown to the point where the old church was no longer big enough to house everything. And through a gift from the philanthropist James Lick, this tall building was built on Market Street to be the home of the California Academy of Sciences. This picture was taken in the year 1891 so that's 120 years ago. In the front, there were shops. In the middle part, there were the many exhibits. And the collections and the offices for scientists were in the rear. Market Street was one of the most important streets in the city of San Francisco. And the California Academy of Sciences played an important part. Next, please. Here are some historic photographs from the interior of the museum on Market Street. We have once again the uh, woolly mammoth, which was brought there from the previous museum in the Congregational Church. Uh, many other exhibits serve to illustrate the idea of evolution, an idea that in the 19th century was new and radical. And the California Academy of Sciences, from the beginning, took a lead in promoting and explaining the idea of organic evolution. Here is a man dressed in the style of the late 19th century in the USA, standing next to a prepared specimen of a grizzly bear, the world's largest bear. And for years, the academy flourished as a place for education and entertainment and as a place for scientific research, publishing its own journal and accumulating a huge collection of more than a million specimens, including a collection of insects from old San Francisco. Before San Francisco became a city, it comprised a sand dune environment that had many unique species of animals and plants. Next, please. But then in 1906, disaster struck. An earthquake, which is estimated to have been at a magnitude greater than eight, struck early in the morning, knocked down many buildings, but worse still were fires. It started fires all over the town, and most of the city of San Francisco burned to the ground. Here is the California Academy of Sciences. A complete disaster, and there was a loss of most of the collections. Some of the scientists ran into the burning building, climbed up the broken staircases to save rare books and type specimens of plants and insects. Uh, they risked their lives to save some of the scientific legacy, but the greater part was lost. Next, please. 
Here's a picture of the interior of the museum after it was destroyed. The woolly mammoth was completely gone, as were all of the other specimens and displays that you saw in the earlier pictures. It was a terrible disaster, but it wasn't the end. Next, please. At the time of the earthquake, the Academy of Sciences had a group of scientists in the field. They had left in 1905 for an expedition to the Galapagos Islands off the coast of Ecuador. And they were there for more than two years collecting all manner of specimens. Now here is a picture of their boat, the Schooner Academy, uh, taken from the shores of Galapagos Islands. Next, please. Here is the crew of scientists on that boat, uh, several men from California Academy, including an entomologist, someone who studies insects, close to my heart, and the captain of the schooner. They were away for more than two years collecting all manner of animals and plants, and they returned in late 1906 to a destroyed San Francisco that was in the process of being rebuilt. Next, please. The collections from that expedition made the nucleus of the collections that we conserve today. The collections from these little islands, the Galapagos. And even today, the California Academy continues in that tradition of exploration of Earth and description of life on Earth. And many of our, much of our focus goes to places that are popularly called biotic hotspots. Um, many of these are depicted on this map. Here in Colombia, we're in a biotic hotspot. My home in California is also a biotic hotspot. Madagascar, Philippines, places I have done scientific research, many conform to the definition of hotspot, which is that there are many species, that many of these species are unique to that place, in other words, they're endemic, and finally, that place is under threat of destruction. Certainly, that's the case in my home of California. We have a population of 35 million people, nearly as many as live in Colombia. So the scientists at California Academy of Sciences make expeditions to collect specimens and collect other scientific data. Next, please. Much of our focus is on what we can call mega-diverse groups, that is, groups with more than 10,000 known species. I like to show this drawing because the animals and plants in this drawing are depicted in proportion to the richness of species on Earth. And being an arachnologist, I'm happy to see this gigantic mite. Entomologists may be happier still to see the huge insect. Um, some groups dear to our hearts and very important are relatively species poor, though. There's an elk hiding beneath the giant mushrooms. At the California Academy of Sciences and at the Essex Museum at Berkeley, where I'm an adjunct, we focus on all manner of organisms. We have botanical and zoological studies. We have studies both from land and sea. And we do include studies of mega diverse groups. Next, please. And I'd like to next show you some photos showing how we conduct expeditions here in the 21st century. Many things are similar to uh, the way they were a hundred years ago, but some things are different. Um, recently, scientists from California Academy of Sciences conducted an expedition to a biodiversity hotspot, the Philippines Island. We did this in conjunction with the University uh, of uh, Los Banos and the Natural History Museum in Manila important scientific institutions within the Philippines, and we partnered with Filipino scientists and students to make an expedition in three different areas, 
the deep sea, the shallow water, and the land. This is a picture taken um, at this shallow water. Next, please. Here are some of the shallow water organisms. These are annelid worms, a kind of invertebrate. Next, please. Um, we have specialists in mollusks, especially sea slugs. These are some of the most beautiful creatures. Uh, they lose their colors when preserved. So the students of sea slugs or nudibranchs uh, take color photos in the field before these uh, animals are preserved. Next, please. In addition to uh, exploration in shallow water using scuba gear and uh, snorkels, uh, members of our expedition went on a research vessel and sent down trawls to great depths of over 2,000 meters where a very different uh, fauna lives compared to that of shallow water. Here is the uh, research vessel, and here the trawler has gone into the ocean. Next, please. Uh, here is one of our scientists, John McCosker, uh, holding a unknown species of giant eel from the depths. And here are some other deep sea fish, fish from, that live more than a thousand meters down, where it's always dark. Next, please. But I'll spend more time talking about the terrestrial parts of the expedition, because this is where I spent my time. We had a team of entomologists and a team of botanists. The botanists are here below. There are quite a few of them. But the entomology team is shown at the top. Uh, there I am. Here's my student, Hannah Wood. My student, uh, Vanessa Knudsen, and my student, uh, Natalia Khosopolidori. We had Orly, Sheng, Mark, and Beverly, who are scientists from the Philippines. And the eight of us spent more than a month together in, a, in the jungle. As I think you can see from the smiles, we became good friends. <laughs> Next, please. Uh, doing expeditions to remote places has its discomforts but also its pleasures. This is a picture from one of our field camps on Mount Isorog, a jungle-covered volcano on Luzon Island in the Philippines. Next, please. We had a field laboratory where we studied and prepared specimens. And here are Hannah, Vanessa, and Natalia hard at work uh, preparing and studying specimens. Next, please. Um, much of the field work was quite arduous. The hike up Mount Banahau uh, was one of the most difficult of my life. I'm looking down the trail at Orly and one of our assistants. It was extremely steep. It was raining most of the time. It's amazing to me that at 62 years old I was able to make it, but I did. And the rewards were many. Next, please. The dangers were also many. Uh, this is a palm, a Filipino palm, covered with spikes. And if one slips on the trail and accidentally grabs this to, to uh, stabilize yourself, you're in for a handful of trouble. Next, please. These lovely creatures are terrestrial leeches. They don't live here in South America. There is a group which lives in Chile. But in the rainforests of Asia and Australia, these are extremely common. They are silent. You don't feel them. They have a wonderful anesthetic. And typically, the first that you know that you've met one of these creatures is you find yourself bleeding uncontrollably where the leech has fed and dropped off. Kind of unpleasant. Next, please. I want to show you some pictures of the botanists. Uh, here they're preparing specimens collected in the field. Next, please. And here a botanist has climbed the tree and is using a pole pruner to collect uh, flowers and fruits from branches too, too thin to support his weight. Um, I understand that in some cases, uh, monkeys have been used to climb trees and collect plants. But botanists are quite uh, good climbers as well. We're primates, just like monkeys and other apes. 
And except for our weight, we can go way up the trees as this botanist is doing. Next, please. Here are some of the interesting plants found in the Philippines. And the one I want to particularly point out is this thing here. These are flowers of the genus Raphalesia. This is actually the world's smallest Raphalesia, but the diameter of that flower is like this. In other parts of tropical Asia, there are some with this diameter. The Raphalesia is a parasite of vines. It doesn't have chlorophyll, but it produces these flowers from vines, and it is pollinated by carrion feeding insects. So these remarkable flowers smell like rotting flesh. Next, please. Another iconic plant of Southeast Asia are the pitcher plants. And here's a particularly beautiful example. There is water in here with some digestive fluid. And insects, which fall into this pitcher, find that they can't escape. The inside of the pitcher is lined with downward-facing hairs. So the insects drown in the fluid and are slowly digested by the plant. This is a carnivorous plant. Next, please. Next, I'd like you to show you some of the techniques that the arachnologists and entomologists use in, on our expeditions. So let's go around the world to Madagascar, another island where I've done studies. Here are my students, Alma and Daniela, setting out pitfall traps to collect ground-dwelling insects and arachnids. The pitfall trap has a capture fluid, which uh, Daniela is holding there. Uh, she'll pour that through a strainer uh, that Alma is holding and strain out the insects and arachnids. This is a great way of collecting a fauna which cannot be accessed in any other way. Next, please. Here we are, still in Madagascar, um, looking into the leaf litter. And when I say litter, I don't mean plastic wrap and cigarette butts. I mean the leaves, the stems, and the dirt that covers the forest floor. This student from Southeast Asia has filled the sifting bag with leaf litter and is shaking that leaf litter to concentrate it here in the sleeve. Here, two of our field assistants in Madagascar are hauling many kilos of concentrated leaf litter back to our camp. And here, we have hung the leaf litter in these devices, which are called Winkler funnels. The litter simply hangs for a couple of days, and the insects and arachnids, including many pseudoscorpions, fall into the capture uh, jars at the bottom. Next, please. For flying insects and also fast-running spiders, we set out what appears to be a tent. But to the insects, it doesn't appear to be there at all. They fly very quickly through the forest, hit a, an invisible screen, and fly up to the capture tube here. And Natalia and uh, Hannah are setting up a flight trap in the jungles of the Philippines. Next, please. Here we are in the Philippines collecting at night. This is the whole team from California Academy of Sciences, Vanessa, Natalia, Anna, and me. Hand collecting at night is one of the most important ways to find insects and arachnids. Uh, herpetologists use this technique all the time, too. You simply walk around in the forest at night watching for interesting things. And it's remarkable the variety of animals that you'll find which hide during the day, but come out at night. Next, please. I have to show you a special technique used only by those who study spiders. This is called web dusting or puffing. This contraption, which I'm holding here, is filled with a very fine powder, uh, maize powder or cornstarch, and I blow it into the dark, it sticks to webs and makes them visible. Here from the mountains of uh, southern China, we have seven or eight different kinds of webs, which are totally invisible because they are built in very dark places. 
Uh, with the puffer, you can visualize the web. Almost any photograph of a web you'll see in a scientific publication has been dusted previously. And by finding the web, it's then an easy matter to find the spider that made it. Next, please. Finally, a popular trick with uh, entomologists is to attract insects to light. Here, Sheng and Natalia have set out a sheet at night in the Philippines. It's covered with flying insects, as were they. Uh, they began to laugh and cry from all the insects that came to the sheet and landed in their hair and went in their shirts. But it's a great way of collecting night flying insects, including some of the most spectacular Lepidoptera and Coleoptera. What do we have next? Uh, just a final comment on the pleasures of field work. Those places where nature is least disturbed today are exactly those places that are hardest to reach. Uh, here are some pictures from Madagascar showing some of the difficulties of getting to the field sites. Um, sometimes you have to take a boat. Cars get stuck all the time. But when you get there, you're greeted beautiful views of very, very remote places as here on the Marojej mountain in Madagascar. Next. All kinds of unexpected things happen. This is at Beza Mahapali, which is in a desert, but in Madagascar, in the desert, when two cyclones conver converge, we were here, it rains a lot. <laughs> Next, please. And sometimes you've just got to give up tweeting, you've got to put down the GPS, turn off the computer, and just get out and push the truck. <laughs> Okay, let's move on. Some of the pleasures of field work are these remarkable spiders. Here's an Acrocylus, a poor building spider. Next. An Easter egg weevil, a very beautiful sort of beetle from the Philippines. Next. And the only animal that I really fear, here's a Scolopendra morcentipede. This animal is about this long. It can pinch with this end that has a pair of poison claws near the head, which can inflict an extremely painful bite. So I handle these very carefully. Next. Let's go back to the collections. I want to tell you about why we have collections and how we use collections. I showed you how we make them. Now let's look at what we do with them. Here are some collections at the California Academy of Sciences. Um, various kinds of butterflies from the Neotropics and from Borneo. These are from Borneo. These are from the Neotropics, probably Peru. They live here too, the beautiful morphos. Next. Why do we collect and why do we use the collections? Next. We practice the science of systematics. Systematics is the science of species discovery. It's the science of reconstructing organic evolution in time and space. And it's the science behind preserving biodiversity. Next. So I want to spend a little time talking about the relevance of my science, the science that we practice here the science of systematics. Relevance includes, um, it is the principal way of communicating about nature. Next. Because it's a science of conserving and interpreting evidence, it's also a science which allows us to make predictions, allows us to make predictions about nature. And finally, I think we can all agree that to preserve nature, it really helps to understand it. And the science of systematics uh, gives us much of our understanding of nature. Next. So first I want to speak some of communication and how it has remained the same and how it's changed through the years. Uh, here is a picture from a book published in 1758 
uh, Swedish Spiders, published by Carolus Clerk. Um, these are beautiful paintings. You can recognize Northern European spiders today from using his paintings. So the descriptive aspect of our science is primary, but it's not only descriptive, it's also hypothetical. Next, please. When we say this is a species, we're presenting an hypothesis. Species are hypotheses, and I want to illustrate with this example from some research that my student Daniela Andrea Malala did on horned jumping spiders from Madagascar. So we have three individuals that she has photographed. We could make an hypothesis that these two are more similar evolutionarily than the third. And so Daniela sorted our collections. She made collections and sorted them. And she tested these hypotheses. She used comparative anatomy and also compared several genes across these spiders. And in fact, she found that that hypothesis, that these are the same, is wrong. She falsified that hypothesis. In fact, she determined using molecular data that this one and this one are the same species. In fact, they're a male and a female of the same species. These born jumping spiders have remarkable sexual dimorphism. So she made an hypothesis, she tested it, she falsified her initial hypothesis and has now presented a new hypothesis based on additional data. And so the testing of species hypotheses goes on and on. Next, please. One of my mottos is that specimens are data. We look at a collection, we see a label about where the specimen was collected, uh, when, by whom, whether it was raining, and these are all data, but the specimen itself is the most important and primary data because inherent in the specimen is information from morphology, genetics, about its relations, about its history, and in fact, specimens continue provide, to provide data, some of which we had never even envisioned. Uh, here are some drawings of the genitalia of these Swedish spiders, and one can still use these pictures to identify spiders from Sweden. But back in 1758, when Carolus Clerk made these descriptions, he knew that he could look at a spider and make a drawing he had no idea of DNA. In fact, he didn't even know about evolution. He may have thought about it, but the idea of organic evolution had not even been published. But he collected specimens. Some of these specimens could still be found in European museums. And in addition to the observations made by Clerk, we can now use new techniques, better microscopes, and extraction of genomic material to learn more about these species. Next. Here is a recent but fairly traditional way of communicating. This is a publication that I and other members of my team, Martin Ramirez from Argentina, John Coddington and Norm Platnick from, from the USA, we made this publication in the form of a book in which we collected data about all kinds of spiders. Uh, one of our hypotheses is embodied in this branching diagram or cladogram, which uh, is our surmise as to the evolutionary relationships among different spiders. Um, this is available in, in, as a paper copy. I brought two copies of this book to Eduardo's lab for people to use. I've also given away PDF electronic copies. So this sort of printed communication has been going on for more than 200 years. Next, please. But here we are in the digital era in which the majority of people have at least some access to the internet, and we can now publish on the internet. Uh, this is a 
an issue of the electronic journal Zookeys. And a couple of years ago, a team of us looked at velvet spiders from all over the world. We described all the genera and came up with an hypothesis about their evolution. This was published in Zookeys. Anyone with access to the internet through a, a smartphone or a computer can pull up this paper anywhere in the world and read about what we thought. Next, please. Also available in the digital era is a way of sharing information through photographs. When I began studying biology in the 1970s, I was fortunate in that we had photocopiers. We called them Xerox machines. So the original copy of a book wasn't the only copy. I could actually make a photocopy. Now today, I can make a digital copy and send it to all of you almost instantly. So the accessibility of basic information has increased a hundredfold. Here is the holotype of a spider-eating fly, family Acroceridae. Here it's a specimen kept in the collection of California Academy. But for many biologists, all they'll need to see are these pictures of the fly and of the labels that accompany it. For identifying specimens, these photos may be enough. If you're going to study the evolution of these flies, of course you'll need more. You'll need the actual specimen because you'll want to dig deep into that specimen for new kinds of data. But for identifying specimens or sharing information about the world, these photographs work very well and they're available to everybody through the California Academy of Sciences website. Next, please. I want to emphasize how important it is to share information in every way. Sharing information through publications, through digital resources, and actually through sharing specimens because disasters still happen. You recall the pictures I showed of the California Academy in 1906. Well, this is the Instituto Butantan in Sao Paulo, Brazil, just a few years ago. This is a heartbreaking thing. Some of my best friends are at Instituto Butantan, and they lost a major part of their collection. Fortunately, the specimens that I had lent to students there were kept at their desks, and the students ran into the burning building to save their projects, so all of those survived. But many arachnid specimens and almost the entire collection of snakes, one of the most important snake collections in the whole world, was destroyed by this terrible fire. So I'd like to suggest that we share copies and duplicates of specimens whenever possible. Next, please. And museums do share information. In fact, another of my mottos is that museums are the lending library of the evidence for evolution. You've probably all been to a biblioteca where you can take out a book, take it home, and read it. That's a lending library. Well, museums play that same function in science. Uh, here are two of our scientists at California Academy, on, they're actually in the Philippines, preparing specimens for shipment around the world. Next, please. Here is one of our technicians at California Academy preparing loans of specimens to be sent to scientists at other institutions. Next, please. Here are some insects almost ready for shipment. These are giant water bugs, and we put extra pins in the drawer next to them to brace them so when they're sent through the mail, they don't break. And we send out, the California Academy of Sciences sends out more than 200 specimen loans from entomology every year. And our department, entomology, has in excess of 12 million specimens 
at any one time, one million of these specimens are on loan to other scientists all over the world. Next, please. Here's a parcel uh, ready to go out, signed by our collection manager. Next, please. And this map um, depicts my responsibility. I was once curator of arachnids, myriapods, and flies. And so here we have a map that represents loans of specimens over the period of about um, six years. Um, the size of the dot represents the number of actual transactions, so it doesn't represent whether it was a single specimen or a thousand specimens. But we send specimens all over the USA and all over the world were loans made to institutions in Colombia, probably to Eduardo for you and your students. We finally got those scorpions to you. Um, but this isn't the whole picture. This is a map of the scientific world, but it's somewhat incomplete because there are problems of infrastructure and if I can be blunt, problems of law that make it hard to share information in the form of specimens. Um, no loans to India, but there are many scientists in India. Uh, much of Africa is without loans, none to Madagascar. The reliability of the postal system is inadequate in these countries. So instead of moving specimens, it's sometimes easier to move people. And at California Academy, we've had more than 20 students and scholars from Madagascar come to our institution to study specimens there. So even if we can't move specimens, we can still move people. Next, please. Next, I'd like to talk about the importance of systematics in making predictions about nature. I want to start with a classic example from my home state, California. Uh, you probably think of California for the movie business. This makes California very rich. You've heard of Silicon Valley where they make computers and software and devices and such. Well, long before Hollywood, long before Silicon Valley, California became rich through agriculture. Our state was known for citrus fruit like these oranges. And in the 19th century, the wealth of California became threatened. Next, please. Threatened by this. That's an insect. It's called the cottony cushion scale. It's a pretty simple insect. It's mainly a, it's a bag for sucking sap from plants and making little scales. Um, and it's extremely destructive. It threatened to destroy the nascent citrus industry in California, greatly impoverishing the state. But there was a fortunate thing. Back in the 19th century, there were taxonomists, people like me, Eduardo, Catalina, who really loved our organisms. And there were people who loved these scales so much that they devoted all their spare time to studying them. And they knew from these scientific studies that this thing is related to insects that live in Australia. It's hardly known in Australia, so something must be different. Is there a natural enemy that keeps it under control? And back in the 19th century, it was a fairly easy matter to explore for natural enemies and import them. Next, please. So the explorers went to Australia and they found this beetle. It's a ladybird beetle, family coccinellidae, the Vidalia beetle, and it loves to eat cottony cushion scale. The beetles were introduced to California and they ate almost all of the scales. You can still find each, but the levels of their populations are so small, so low, that they produce no economic damage to oranges. So California was made rich 
by a beetle and by people who had nothing better to do than to think about scales. <laughs> Thank goodness for that. Next, please. From my own research, I want to show you a similar example, maybe not nearly so important in terms of money saved. Uh, the, the, the beetle was worth millions and millions of dollars. This has not been worth a lot of money, but maybe someday it will. Here is a cladogram, or evolutionary tree, for some spiders. I was part of the team that uh, hypothesized this tree. And I did so because I'm interested in the, in the evolution of silk making and uh, sensory organs and in geography. So here is a tree that represents our idea of uh, spider relationships. Next, please. And one of the things that came out of this study is that a well-known spider, the Araña del Rincón, or violin spider, has a relative. It's this rather rare thing called Sicarius. The first Sicarius has only just been discovered here in Colombia. So, next please. We know something about Loxoceles. These are pretty common in Bogota. I saw a lot of them in the collection today. They're very shy, um, but they do live with people. And if you accidentally sit on one, or roll over in bed and squash one, it could bite. It could bite. And in, because they have a cytotoxic compound in their venom, they can cause uh, wounds that are slow to heal or next. In rare cases, extreme tissue damage leading to the loss of a limb or even death. So the Araña de Lincoln is considered a dangerous animal. We discovered that there's another animal closely related. What about that? Next, please. Sicarius, what about these spiders? Next, please. They live in remote places. As I mentioned, none had ever been seen in Colombia until just this last year. Um, the ones I know best live in deserts, such as the Namib here in Africa. They hide, they cover themselves with sand. They're rarely encountered by people, but as human population grows, uh, people might encounter Sicarius. So what are the implications of that? Because the phylogenetic tree serves to um, summarize information, it can also be used to make predictions. And an inherent prediction in that tree is that the venom of these spiders may also be dangerous. And in fact, that is true. Medical researchers in South Africa have studied Sicarius and found that it has a venom much like the Araña del Rincón and is potentially extremely dangerous. Next, please. So we know now to fear Sicarius. What else do we know from the predictions? Well, there are good therapies for treating the bites of Adania del Rincón. Another prediction would be that if someone should be so unfortunate as to be bitten by Sicarius, the first thing to do is to try that same therapy. So here's another prediction. But this is about venom evolution. It's not a subject that really interests me much at all. It wasn't why I got into this at all. I was interested in the evolution of their feet and their spinning organs. But one takeaway message I want to uh, leave with you is that big questions in science can only be answered decisively by extremely focused, detailed studies of what seem to be esoteric systems. In fact, all good science is esoteric. And the second thing is as in this case, when we seek answers to our questions, in this case, how did the feet of these spiders evolve, we find new questions like, well, are they dangerous? And if they're dangerous, what shall we do? So these are inherent in all kinds of science. 
And this is an example of predictions from some of my own very esoteric research. Next, please. Now I want to close by saying a little bit about how systematics, especially as practiced in museums, helps us to understand nature and move to preserve nature. Museums are an historical database. I know that the Arachnid collection here at the University Nacional is 25 years old. We're celebrating the anniversary. The collections at California Academy are 120 years old. Some are older still. And every specimen keeps with it a portrait of the world in which it lived. What was it like? Where was it? Where were they living? When were they living? Next. And one way museums have helped to answer questions has been in reference to a problem we've probably all heard about, the disappearance of frogs. This is a big problem in California and in Central America. It may have come to Colombia by now, I don't know, but it's an absolute disaster. And we know now that there is a fungus, a uh, chytrid fungus, Batrachochytrium dendrobatidis, which affects frogs. It thickens their skin, and because they breathe through their skin, it essentially suffocates them. These pictures were taken in the mountains of California. It's a heartbreaking scene of dead frogs. Where did this come from? Where is it going? Museums provide some answer to that. Next, please. This is the African clawed frog. It comes from Africa, but it was used for decades around the world as a pregnancy test. In fact, um, a little bit of fluid, I think blood from a pregnant woman, would cause this frog to ovulate. It per, the frog perceived the hormonal changes. So doctors used these frogs in pregnancy tests for a long time. Uh, clawed frogs are kept in the Academy's collection. Next, please. This is my friend and colleague Jens Bendem. Uh, retrieving a specimen of a clawed frog from the collection. And here it is. And Jens and Professor Van Svredenberg examined specimens from our collection, more than 200 of them. They examined these specimens for the presence of this deadly fungus. And they found that the fungus has been around for a long time and was probably introduced into the United States and the Americas from Africa with clawed frogs. So we know much more about the history of this fungus. Next, please. 13% of the frogs in the collection were positive for this kindred fungus. Here's a specimen from, uh, that one is, that one is from Africa. We have specimens also from the, from the USA. So it's, the suggestion is that the fungus came to the USA with these frogs decades ago. Next, please. Okay, we're talking about the past and the present. Let's talk about the future. And the last thing I want to share with you is a current project. Uh, we call it CalBug. But the intent is to use museum data to make predictions about the future of life under scenarios of global change. Next, please. This is a project that involves all of the natural history museums in the state of California. Um, it's partially supported by the National Science Foundation in the U.S. Uh, here are the various museums that collaborate. Next, please. The idea is to examine the collections and make digital copies of specimen data across all these collections um, because across collections you have the most complete picture of evolution of any kind of organisms. 
Here is the, the team of principal investigators. Next, please. Uh, we use some fairly simple te technology. We take photographs of the labels and the specimens. Uh, here is a dragonfly with the label photograph. Here are some specimens being photographed. Next, please. Um, more complex is the georeferencing of these specimens. So within a certain margin of error, which is different for every specimen, we can say precisely where it was collected. And in some cases, the data that accompanied the specimen are so precise that we can say it was found outside the door. In other cases, it's a radius of several kilometers around a town. And we need to um, assume certain things about prior distribution. Next. But one of the main reasons we're doing this is these collections, which in some cases are more than 100 years old, give us a clear record across many species of how those species have changed their distribution and lifestyle with changing climate. And we further wish to make predictions about the future under different climate change scenarios. Uh, here is a map of average high temperature in the state of California. It's in degrees Fahrenheit, so this is about 2 degrees centigrade. This is about 38 degrees centigrade. Um, but this is the state as it was in 1950 when I was born. Under some models, here is how the state will look in the year 2090, after I'm dead, but some of you will be around for sure. Look how much hotter it's predicted to be. There'll probably be no snow lasting in the mountains, and the hot deserts will extend through much of the state. What will this mean for things that live in the state? Can we, we have to start planning for this now. And the animals and plants that live in California can tell us something about what could happen. Next, please. Here is a volunteer at my institution collecting data from insects. Next. Um, one of the ways we deal with all these data from the Cal Academy alone, we have digitized more than 200,000 specimens. And the whole project has digitized more than 1 million specimens. One of the things that we have done is to crowdsource the data entry. This is a website uh, called Notes from Nature. And any person with a computer and access to the internet can go online and see our data and type in the, the data, the locality, uh, the state, the country, the date, the collector, all of these things. So we've crowdsourced, and that's the jargon, Silicon Valley jargon, for uh, giving a job to everyone over the internet. And that's helped us reach this million specimen mark. Next, please. This is what you'll see. Here is a bombardier beetle which was collected in Mexico by my friend John Doyen. It was on mud at night. That's where these beetles are usually found. And here's a unique identifier. Next, please. Finally, I want to show you a worked example of what this can do. The California Odinata database is a database of dragonflies and damselflies. This project was led by my friend, a uh, student of a uh, friend. Her name is Joan Ball. She did her PhD at UC Berkeley. And her PhD involved looking at all the dragonflies and asking, what can you tell me about the world? She uh, examined collections from all of these institutions and georeferenced them. Next, please. Um, this represents localities from which dragonflies or damselflies have been collected and exist in museums. It's a remarkable coverage of our state. And in addition to going to museums, Joan 
revisited some collecting sites, here shown in red, and sampled the community of dragonflies and damselflies which live there today. So she had the historical records and she had a modern test example. Next, please. Here are her results. Uh, there are more than 32,000 individual insects, like this beautiful dragonfly, which she was able to access from all those many museums in California. In California, we recognize 106 species within nine families of Odinata. This is the order. The earliest records that she accessed for her study came from 1879 over a, about 150 years ago. And at the time of publication, in 2013, she had specimens collected that same year. Next, please. What did she find? She found that over those 150 years, species of Odinata have actually expanded their ranges northwards by about 70 or 80 kilometers. And this is what one would expect in a warming world. As the world grows warmer, the cold places aren't so cold anymore. And she was able to document that species have actually changed the northern part of their range. Next. Another fascinating thing that she found was that the number of species at an individual site, at this river or this pond really hadn't changed. There were still seven species or eleven species. But the diversity of species declined. The species composition across the state had become more homogeneous. Some species are almost like what we call weeds. Next, please. This homogenization of the Odinate fauna is a result of the expansion of some highly mobile species and the decline of species that are specialists, <coughs> habitat specialists, and which have a stage which becomes quiescent during winter because winter is disappearing. So here are some hard facts about what's really happening in the world. And from these facts, one can make predictions about what's going to happen next. So with this, I'd like to thank you. I'd like to remind you that our science systematics is about communication, about the natural world. That we really can make predictions about nature. And I hope that we all use this understanding to preserve, protect, and sustain nature. And with that, I want to thank the university for the invitation to come here and speak to you. I'd be happy to try to answer questions. Thank you. Gracias, Dr. Grisbull. En este momento daríamos inicio entonces a las inquietudes, preguntas o comentarios. Eh, y debo aclarar que quienes no manejemos un inglés fluido se puede hacer en español. El profesor más o menos entiende y si no tenemos varios traductores aquí para hacernos entender. Bueno, yo tenía una, un comentario, una anécdota, y es que, eh, y que va hacia algo más allá también, es que en Colombia tenemos mucho problema para intercambiar especímenes con otras partes del mundo debido a la legislación. Eh, tuve casualmente la experiencia de hace cuatro años haber solicitado sin conocer personalmente al doctor Ridwood eh, unos escorpiones que íbamos a hacer una revisión de, de un género, el género centruroides, dado que venía para el Congreso Latinoamericano un cubano especialista en ese género. Y yo solo pregunté, ¿tienen estos ejemplares? Bueno, el doctor Alma sabía que estaban en el CAS. Y, y muy amablemente el doctor Grisbol y su ayudante nos enviaron el material, todo el que habíamos pedido 
y qué hicieron las autoridades acá en Colombia apenas llegaron nos incautaron y uh, recibí pues, sí, una llamada de la aduana que el material había sido incautado porque no tenía permiso de ingreso realmente la, la legislación así lo estipula pero digamos antes de hacer la solicitud de importación eh, lo mandaron y el material fue incautado ahí fue toda una odisea tratar de que lo dejaran por lo menos eh, prestar para que como iba a venir ya estaba ya en Colombia Dice el de Armas que lo iba a revisar para que lo prestaran y no lo prestaron después de hacerle pues casi arrodillarnos. Um, pero el caso eh, era como un juicio, ¿no? Eh, está abierto allá una situación de infracción en la cual yo soy el responsable. Eh, hicimos la revisión, la cual se publicó eh, en el género para Colombia, apareció una nueva especie de allí a partir de esa revisión y yo no, decidí no devolverlo a la Secretaría del Ambiente donde estaba el cartel porque pues, podía quedar allá por la eternidad y el material no era colombiano era del CAS aprovechando el viaje de Carlos Parra hace como dos años lo, tres años lo devolví a través de él y yo pensé que la cosa había muerto cuando hace tres meses me llegó de nuevo una citación a la Secretaría del Ambiente por este caso. Fui, afortunadamente, llevé todas las... Yo había hecho, obviamente, un descargo en ese entonces, hace tres, cuatro años, donde explicaba por qué se había pedido, por qué había pasado. Hicimos eh, el convenio con el CAS para el intercambio de especímenes, eh, lo presenté en ese entonces, y ahora llegaba como si nada hubiera ocurrido. Entonces, adjunté esa información más el artículo que publicamos con, con armas donde se daban los agradecimientos al CAS y al doctor Gribble por haber prestado el material eh, yo espero que con esas explicaciones todas esas cartas y el artículo ellos entiendan de que realmente era para una actividad académica para comprender nuestra biodiversidad de una forma mejor que en ese caso, in estábamos interactuando colegas estadounidenses, eh, cubanos y nosotros mismos. Y así debe ser la situación. Esto, finalmente, quiero llegar a que el profesor Rirwell me decía que en Estados Unidos, en este momento, es muy fácil hacer los préstamos. Prácticamente no se quiere casi papeleo, documentos. Pero acá estamos llenos de leguleyadas y... Estados Unidos es casi un continente, imagínense la diversidad que hay allá, la cantidad de ejemplares de todo el mundo, porque en, el, en ese préstamo había material de color, en el que yo hice, había de Ecuador, de Guinea, de Guyanas, de acá de Colombia, y no pone problemas. Si nosotros como país que prácticamente pretendemos copiar en todos los desarrollados y sobre todo Estados Unidos, también deberíamos de copiar esa política y no caer en ese exacerbado nacionalismo o lo que nos devino a través del boom de la biodiversidad de que queremos atesorar todo y como que no compartir con nadie eso no está obstaculizando mucho el conocimiento era eh, para hacer ese llamado y agradecerle de nuevo por la charla por el préstamo de los escorpiones <risa> y eh, bueno no sé si quiero hacer otros comentarios Gracias a todos. Preguntica en inglés, no importa. No importa. O en español. Es que eh, acá estamos arrancando con un. Eh, bueno, arrancando, es que eh, estamos sistematizando las colecciones. We're digitizing specimens here. Mm -hmm. We have a very active specimen digitization program. Mm -hmm. We're much more advanced with plant specimens than mm -hmm. we are with animal collections mm -hmm. because the methods are much easier to standardize. Uh, it's for plant photography. It's a two-dimensional object, the same lighting conditions, everything. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have um, your, we, we have limited pho photographs available for our insect collections right now. Mm -hmm. All of the types are photographed and are available online but we don't have a standard protocol for insect photography. And I was wondering yeah, if, if you'd be willing to share 
these protocols. <laughs> yes, I would be happy to share the protocols. I think I'll need to send you a message, okay. an email message. But yes, um, <clears throat> the protocols involve taking uh, photographs of the crucial identifi identification parts mm -hmm. which are specified by specialists. Uh, Eduardo knows what part of the scorpion matters. Mm -hmm. I know what part of the spider matters. Um, we use a method of making high uh, depth of field images called uh, stacking mm -hmm. photography. Um, and the software for doing this is now pretty cheap and widely available. Um, the, the internet technology uh, questions about how to share these data are really kind of beyond me. Okay. But I, I can provide some information. Uh, the Academy of Sciences and the Essig Museum at Berkeley are both uh, hoping to digitize and share collections data. And I will call your attention to AntWeb, the Tela de Hormigas, <laughs> which is perhaps the most complete and sophisticated digital sharing of data about any group of insects. So yes, um, I'd be happy to share more detail over the internet. Tengo una pregunta. Sí. Eh, por ejemplo, en los casos donde se trabajan más que todo, pues, eh, con individuos que tienen poblaciones pequeñas, que muchos científicos simplemente van y toman eh, una gran cantidad simplemente porque, pues, bajo la excusa de de la protección y todo eso. ¿Usted qué, qué opina en cuanto a eso? Um, I think no scientist, well, I, no scientist is able to collect a significant portion of the individuals of any mobile species. In the case of plants, it might be possible for people to destroy them all in making collections. So I think it's impossible, because many will be inaccessible. But in the case of mobile creatures, even large animals, um, I think there is no evidence that collecting for scientific purposes has really harmed the species. Is that the question? Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, um, and there's much controversy about this just now as to whether collecting is still necessary. And the answer to that has been by example. The ways of understanding evolution that we have today were inconceivable when some specimens were collected. And I think it's reasonable to assume that in the future, these same specimens will be studied in ways that we can't conceive today. So I think that it is worthwhile to collect large numbers via mass collecting methods. And what we try to do is, is share out these specimens among various institutions because um, it's safer to have specimens distributed. Um, we can share the data digitally much more easily than in the past. But I must say that there'll always be the case that a specimen that you need to study is in some other country. And I think the idea of repatriation can be taken too far. Every year, I send specimens from our collection to the country of origin 
because they were collected under convenios that required this, and I have no problem with that. So we do this a lot. Um, but my concern is that specimens, wherever they're kept, that those data are allowed to flow freely. Um, it doesn't matter to me so much if the specimens are in California or China or Colombia, if it's possible for the scientist who may be in Madagascar or Russia to see those data when they're studying the group around the world. So I want to urge, especially the young people here, to try to streamline the laws to make it easier to share data. In the U.S. we can still do it, but it's getting much harder. When I was a student to prepare to send a loan to Colombia or Brazil, of 500 specimens would take me one day. Now it takes three days, one day to prepare them, and two more days to fill out papers. So I have to plead with everybody to try and streamline the laws to make the flow of specimens and other data and people easier. But it's only when we all cooperate and share will we have the best picture of life on Earth. Is that clear what I said? That's my philosophy about collections. <laughs> Any other uh, comments or questions? Yo tengo una pregunta, Charles. Sí. Eh, hablábamos de la financiación hacia los museos. Eh, pues que en los países de, de desarrollo es bastante pobre, o sea, no hay financiación. Eh, ¿Conoces de um, países eh, que financien ese tipo de cosas? Sé que Estados Unidos también está decayendo en la financiación hacia museos. ¿En qué otras partes del mundo? ¿O, ni, o no hay? Um, el año pasado, uh, uh, well, uh, well, Brasil, pero no, no está hoy día en Brasil. I think some developing countries which have become wealthy are investing in biodiversity knowledge. In China, there are lots of scientists who are supported by the government, the same in Korea. But the scientists in those countries are isolated, or we are isolated from them. I have to tell a story about doing research in China. Here's a country that's developing scientifically at a remarkable pace. And I went to China in the last century with Chinese colleagues, and we did a study of animals and plants in a certain mountain range. Some specimens remained in China, some went to the USA. Uh, we brought students to China. Pardon, we brought students to the USA, we sent students to China, and at the end of certain projects, when the results had been published, I attempted to send the specimens as agreed to China, and Chinese customs refused. They sent them back to the USA. Um, this was a problem of the implementation of the law, not of science. I'm not going to say any more on camera, but ultimately we solved that problem. But as with Eduardo's example, there are truly crazy things that can happen. Chinese authorities prevented me from sending Chinese specimens to China <laughs> under our agreement with China. <laughs> Crazy things can happen. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Well, if you have more questions, then I'll ask you to ask Charles for that.